bringing tokens onto Bitcoin and Lightning, so with projects such as Taput Assets or even RGB, because it's really it's quite similar. Let's put it that way. Um, it's uh, I think it's interesting, but can be dangerous. The goal is to bring DLCs to Lightning. This way you can have uh, the same things, but off chain. The problem that isn't addressed per se by, by DLCs is how to find a, a counterparty for your trade. So for, say, for example, that you want to, to short Bitcoin, you'd have to find someone who's, who agrees to loan Bitcoin for the same amount. 90% of users but they only contribute 10% of the overall volume. And then the 10% that remain, they contribute 90% of the volume. One thing we could look at is how it could interact with Nostr. So maybe we could, you could, uh, I don't know, but you could maybe uh, trade on the markets without leaving your Nostr clients. Fenis Mikalakis is a developer at LN Markets, a Bitcoin derivatives exchange built on the Lightning Network. In our conversation, we talked all about trading on Lightning. We talked about taproot assets, whether that will have an impact on LN Markets business. We talked about LN Markets in general and some of the different types of trading that can be enabled on Lightning and so much more. Before we get into today's show, just a quick message from our sponsor. Today's show is sponsored by Stackwork. Stackwork is a Lightning powered transcription tool. It takes the best of AI and humans to create better, faster, less expensive transcripts. We'll have more from Stackwork later in the show. Fanis, welcome to the show. I am so excited to talk about Ellen Markets, the work you're doing in the Lightning ecosystem, the great Lightning newsletter that you write. But before we get into that, let's step back, give listeners a bit of perspective, tell everyone a little bit about your life prior to Bitcoin. Okay. First, thanks for, for having me. I'm really glad to be here because um... I'm a watcher of the show, and uh, it's really, uh, it's really fun to be uh, to be there. Uh, my life prior to Bitcoin, I was just uh, an engineering student. Uh, prior to that, I discovered first crypto and then Bitcoin. Sad, uh, sadly, in this order, uh, during my uh, while I was a student, and I yeah, I decided to get involved. Uh, participating in an, a student association on the topic. And then I, I, I joined Ellen Markets as my first job uh, post-graduation. And, and that's it. What was the, you said you discovered crypto and then Bitcoin. What was the reason that crypto first kind of stuck in your mind and made you go, wow, that's pretty cool. And then what was the reason you decided then to switch over to Bitcoin? Basically, I, I'd say it's ignorance. Because of course I knew Bitcoin existed, but I just dismissed it. Uh, I viewed it at, as the uh, old dinosaur that was already uh, uh, kind of deprecated, and I was all in on uh, Ethereum uh, stuff like that. So the yeah, I think it's quite a, a common uh, trap for for newcomers to to believe that uh, Ethereum is is uh, the one thing and uh, it, and Bitcoin is too old and uh, and doesn't do anything and it really took me uh, yeah a real step back after the uh, 2017 bull run to yeah mature that in my mind and finally understand what it was all about and how Bitcoin is it's a real thing and Ethereum is just a distraction. Was the Lightning Network, did that play a role in you understanding that you could do things on Bitcoin? Yeah, definitely, because uh, I really came to this realization in 2019, 2020, something like that. So Lightning was becoming something you could actually use. And so I still remember using Phoenix for the first time at this time, for example. It was already a, a wallet you could use without having to really understand how lightning works behind the scenes. And so it was really yes, kind of a, a aha moment for me when I discovered lightning this way. And I, I'm sure it played a role. So there is this aspect and then the monetary aspect as well and the censorship resistance aspect, which really played a role. But the fact that lightning is, existed and, and allowed to uh, make Bitcoin what it was supposed to be in the first place, so peer-to-peer -peer cash. Uh, yeah, it really matters 
for my decision to focus on Bitcoin at this time. Yeah. And so you tried out Phoenix, started playing around with Lightning. What, what then made you go, I want to build on Lightning. I want to be building cool tools that push this space forward. So yeah, it's, I swear it's uh, the real story, but when I first played with uh, Phoenix, one of the websites I played with Phoenix on was Ellen Markets at the time, because they launched in uh, March 2020. It was a pandemic. I was bored at home. Uh, and so, yeah, I just played with it and you could already use uh, LN URL to, to log in onto LN Markets. And it was kind of magic because you, for the first time, you just have to scan a QR code with an app on your phone and you're, you're logged into the website. It was, uh, yeah. And uh, yeah, I, I guess um, LN Markets being a French company, really helped as well because, and there is uh, Async uh, who develops Phoenix, which is a French company as well. And so as I was coming out of my uh, engineering school, I was looking for uh, yeah, basically opportunities, uh, but in France. And so it really helped to see that there was a, a scene uh, locally already uh, with uh, potentially job opportunities. That's amazing that Ellen Markets, I, I just totally forgot that it, it was March, 2020 when it launched. So it's been up for over, three years now, when did you get in touch with the team and decide that this was a company you wanted to work with? So basically what happened was I was doing uh, my uh, end of school internship. So in, in, in engineering schools in France, you have to do a six month internship at the end. And so I was doing this in a, uh, I don't know how you call this. In a, uh, like an internship between after school? Yeah, exactly. And it was not really, it was in the fiat world. It wasn't really interesting, but I wanted to try this out to confirm that I wasn't definitely interested in working in this area and that I wanted to go all in on Bitcoin. And right at this moment, I saw uh, on Roma, Roma's Twitter uh, that they were looking for developers and I just sent him a, a DM and uh, yeah, he answered, uh, why not? And we had uh, a few calls and, uh, and that was it. I had I had Romain on the show. Uh, I want to say it was episode three, two or three, one of those early episodes, and I think it was three. And this was October of twenty twenty one. So I guess it had been up for a while, but it was one of those things where there there were only like it felt like to me at the time there was only like a handful of companies building on Lightning. And I was, I was going through them one by one. I was like, I want to talk to everyone in the Lightning ecosystem. And I thought to myself, there may only be like 10 or 12 people that are willing to talk to me. And, and that might be the end of the show. That might just be it. But of course, as, as time went on, I discovered way more people building. I think there was an influx of new people that came in to build. And now here we have this incredible Lightning ecosystem that just continues to grow every month it seems. Um, and I, I, I love watching the, the numbers on LN markets continue to tick up. Uh, but for those who aren't familiar with LN markets, can you just give a quick high level overview of how you explain the product to people? So right now what LN market is, is a, a centralized derivative trading platform. So derivatives are things like futures and options where you can uh, kind of bet on the price of Bitcoin on how it moves. Uh, let's put it that way. And what sets us apart is that we are using Lightning for deposits and withdrawals. And this way, users can have the, their funds on their own Lightning wallets. So yeah, it's safe. It's uh, their own keys. And when they want to trade, they can instantly and quite cheaply deposit funds on the platform, open a trade. And when the trade is over and they want to get back uh, their funds, they can do so uh, instantly as well because we're using light lightning for withdrawals too. And so it helps mitigate one of the most important risks for traders, which is counterparty risk, where your funds, while they're on the platform, they are at risk of being stolen by the platform or by an hacker, or if the platform uh, uh, go in bankruptcy, maybe you'll lose your fund, you don't know. Uh, and so the, the goal is to minimize the amount of time during which you need to have your funds on the platform. And so right now on LN Market, it's just the duration of the trade and nothing more. And of course, we're looking uh, at improving on that so that the whole trading experience can be self-custodial 
but right now, as we are right now, uh, once you deposit the fence to open a trade, it's custodial. But you can take control, take back control as soon as the trade is over. Okay, I want to touch on custody a bit later in the show, but first I want to focus on Lightning because I think there's still a lot of people who they may have a Coinbase account or they may have some other you know centralized trading platform in their jurisdiction and it may not have Lightning integrated. Can you just double down on that pitch for why Lightning is so important? What does that mean for traders? And are there any kind of interesting, maybe for advanced or more professional traders, what are some of the improvements that they might see to their profits and losses by being able to leverage Lightning? So what Lightning brings is essentially uh, instantaneity. So when you're using Outchain, you, you have to wait, especially when uh, depositing on, uh, on exchanges, you have to wait typically four to six confirmations. So that means when your transactions get mined in a block, you have to wait for three to five additional blocks to be mined on top of this block before the exchange will consider that your, your deposit is uh, final and that will then let you use your funds on the platform. So that means that when you deposit, you usually have to wait at least one hour before you can use the funds. Uh, and for if you're just using your the exchange to, to DCA, for example, it's not a, such a big deal. You can wait. But if you're trying to, uh, to trade, to time the market, to, to do stuff like that, where there is really a, a, a time uh, aspect to it, uh, what you're incentivized to do then is to just leave the fund on the platform so that you're sure that they are, they are already there and they're ready to be used when you need them. The Lightning essentially um, um, removes the need for to keep funds on the platform because you, just, you can just deposit and it will instantly be available for use on the platform. You don't have to wait anymore. And on top of that, when what we've seen is that when on-chain fees are, are high, uh, it, it becomes more and more interesting to use Lightning because on Lightning uh, you have, uh, so the fee model on Lightning is completely different. At times it, it can be more interesting to use on-chain, but when on-chain fees are high, it's more and more interesting to use Lightning to, to raise the funds. Do you see a big spike in usage of LN markets when we have some of these on-chain fees really spiking up? Not really. What really drives uh, volume on LN markets is essentially uh, price volatility. And we don't see much of uh, action coming from uh, yeah, on-chain congestion at, at all, I, I think. Because I guess, yeah, people who use on-chain are... So, yeah. I, I don't think they think of LN markets as a way to to uh, to avoid the I on chain fees yet. Maybe it will come one day. But and are LN markets users are they are they like hedging on LN markets and making trades elsewhere? Are they using using this as like an arbitrage opportunity between exchanges, or or is it mostly just people trading on LN markets as their single trading venue? Uh, good question. We don't really know, I guess, what people are doing on the platform. Um, some of them are different. I think are using a market as a main venue. Um, but yeah, we would. I don't think we would have a way to to really know uh, uh, to really know that. Um, we could maybe look at data from other exchanges and try to to guess if they are doing some arbitrage, but. Our own price feed is derived from uh, from BitMEX, for example, or MD Rebit. So um, I don't think there is much of an arbitrage opportunity there because if I wanted to arbitrage BitMEX or Deribit's price, I would be doing so in BitMEX or Deribit uh, themselves. Unless maybe there is the lightning aspect, which will be, uh, would be interesting for them. Maybe it could be a way indeed to to arbitrage BitMEX or Deribit prices, but uh, more efficiently because you can move the funds with Lightning instead of having to wait for, for confirmations. All right, I want to talk about trading specifically because I think this word is 
like a lightning rod for Bitcoiners. There's there's a, a lot of uh, very strong opinions on trading. And I think many Bitcoiners will look at it and go, trading is a fiat business. It is essentially gambling. It is not, you know, real Bitcoiners don't do that is what is what the kind of, kind of critique might be. Uh, I want I want you to take the opposite side of that argument and talk a bit about why this trading tool that you've built on LN Markets is an important piece of infrastructure. Yeah, sure. So yeah, of course it's uh, today it's it's often something quite speculative to trading on uh, yeah derivatives and stuff like that, but uh, it's not only that as you as you point out and. It didn't originate it like that because the first derivatives actually were on. Uh, I think well, it's, maybe it's uh, it's not really what happened, but uh, the first uh, option was on olive oil back in uh, ancient Greece, and it was to try to edge against the fluctuation of the price. So, for example, the idea is that, for example, if you were if you were a baker and you're producing bread, uh, there are a few things that come. Uh, into the, the fabrication of bread. And so, for example, there's wet, there's energy, stuff like that. But let, let's take wet, for example. Uh, what you'd want to do is you you, you need to buy wet, uh, for example, every three months, and then you want to be able to sell your bread for uh, one euro per baguette uh, every time because else people won't buy it. And so, but you, you can be sure of the price of wet in, uh, in, in the next months. And so what you're going to do is try to reduce uncertainty by uh, buying a contract that allows you to buy wet at a given price in the future. Uh, and you're buying this contract, so you're paying a little premium now, but to have the certainty that you'll be able to buy wet at a certain price later. And so that's basically what futures and options are. And that's why they were made in the first place as a tool to edge against price fluctuations. And I, as you can see, there are many, many uh, cases where it might be interesting for you. So it's in the example I, I took, it's really clear for uh, uh, yeah, productive activities where you have to, to use resources and, uh, and transform them. But there are cases where it's useful for individuals as well. Uh, for example, when you want to uh, try to uh, reduce Bitcoin's volatility because you're trying to use it as a mean of payment in your everyday life and it's just not uh, sweeting this use case right now because it varies too much, uh, you might use derivatives to try to uh, reduce the volatility uh, and get something that is more stable in terms of uh, dollar or in terms of uh, purchasing power, for example. Are there any other examples of Bitcoin businesses that you can speak to where where it's kind of like this baker situation where the baker has a bunch of input costs, they have to buy the, the wheat, they have to buy some of the other um, components of the bread and they don't want to take on that risk. Like who, who is an example of like a Bitcoin business that might have a similar view as this baker would? Miners are, are the, the prime example, I think, because they are extremely dependent on the price of energy, for example. And there is a price of hardware as well, but I believe quite less so. So the prime component of uh, a miner's margins comes from its ability to pay uh, for, to, to buy cheap energy, basically. So they are huge interest in having exposure to, uh, yeah, to this kind of instruments for, for energy. And I guess they are, they are doing this. Uh, what they are doing as well is purchasing, uh, uh, is doing contract agreements uh, with, uh, with energy producers. So they are, this way they are looking in a price and in exchange, they're, they're engaging themselves to, uh, for example, consume uh, this much uh, power during uh, this much years. So they're already doing it. And uh, I think it was uh, Luxor Mining who is uh, working actually uh, right now on, uh, uh, they already developed it, but they, they are proposing some hash rate, hash rate or index, which can be used to edge uh, uh, 
against the fluctuations of hash rate price or how much it costs you to, to produce uh, a given uh, number of hash per second. So yeah, miners, I think are really in need of something like that. And they are, I'm sure, using this kind of instruments all over the place. Are there any other forms of trading or any other forms of derivatives that you think might be useful to build on Bitcoin or Lightning? Like maybe outside of futures and options. Is there anything else that, that kind of fits into the derivatives category? Um, I don't know. I think what might be interesting is to build stuff that you can uh, have by composing with futures and options. I, I don't know. So maybe there are my, my, I'm not really in the financial profile of, of the company, so I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't be able to really say, but... Uh... Outside of financial derivatives, are there any other types of trading that you'd like to see proliferate on lightning because like one thing that i've talked about a couple times i i see this as like a real obvious opportunity but it seems like no one has taken uh the chance to build this yet is sports betting on Lightning, where it seems like the tools are all there to build something cool on lightning the average bet size for most sports books online is like eight or ten dollars fits roughly in the size of lightning payments seems like instant settlement is a very valuable thing. And to me, I just go like, well, that seems like a cool idea to be built on lightning that no one's, no one's quite done yet. Is there anything else along that line that kind of strikes you as an interesting thing to be built on lightning? So yeah, sports baiting, I think is a, is a very good example. Um, apart from that, um, I'm not sure I'm saying something right now, but I, I agree with you that the sports baiting is uh, weirdly, it's weird that it isn't a big thing yet because lighting really is useful for that. I think it, it would it would make everything um, easier. And there are a few, I, I think a few uh, platforms that propose uh, lightning and deposits and withdrawals and allow you to, to bet. But yeah, it's still a uh, small platform. Uh, sometimes you're not really sure uh, where you're depositing your funds to. So, so yeah, there is this aspect as well. Um, but yeah, no, I, I don't have any other. I, you know, I think I think the reason sports betting strikes me as interesting is because typically these are short enough durations that you're you know you're betting that week for a game, and you're not betting like six months in advance, usually. So uh, I think it's uh, HODL contracts, uh, Super Test Nets project, um, and uh, it kind of lets you make those bets in shorter time frames. but it might not work very well for something like prediction markets, like a general political prediction market where you might be betting you know, a year in advance, who's going to be the next president of whatever country. Um, so, yeah, I, I just, I guess for all listeners, I'd encourage everyone to think really critically about what tools can be built on Lightning. And I think they'll find that there's some interesting new ones that haven't even been tackled yet. So excited to see more innovation in that space. I want to talk a little bit about Taproot Assets now. And first, just get your thoughts on Taproot Assets as a project, what do you think about it and w where does it fit in at LN Markets, if at all? So um, bringing tokens onto Bitcoin and Lightning, so with projects such as Taproot Assets or even RGB, because it's really, it's quite similar, let's put it that way. Um, it's, uh, I think it's interesting, but can be dangerous at the same time, for some reasons. Um, so yeah, as you can say, I'm not completely settled on the matter yet because, so for, for example, when I'm, I'm saying it's it kind of dangerous, it's, uh, we've seen stuff, for example, on the Ethereum blockchain with um, stablecoin issuers, for example, such as uh, USDC, who 
because they are in, in position of deciding which fork of, of the chain is the valid one and hence they will uh, so they are in the position to to decide which fork in case of a, a soft fork for example they will regard as the valid one and so hence uh, USDCs will have value only on this side of the fork and so it puts them in a, a really strong position to influence uh, the evolution of, of the protocol. And that's something that we've already seen played out during the, the merge on Ethereum between uh, Proof of Work and Proof of Stake. And I think it's something that we should be a bit worried about uh, on Bitcoin, because right now, because we don't have uh, these huge tokens, uh, we're quite protected from that. But um, yeah, that for me, that's the big thing that makes it a bit dangerous. And it's the same for, for drive chain, drive, sorry, drive chains, for example, where uh, if a drive chain becomes too prominent, they can then influence future soft forks as well. So, um, so yeah, that, that's on the uh, uh, cautious part, but then it allows to to create some inter interesting stuff, I guess. Uh, right now, in NN markets, we wouldn't have really a, a fit for that. What could be it could be used, for example, if we wanted to to add uh, equities, for example. I think equities are the, maybe the best example of how useful it could be, uh, because it's not really a shitcoin; it's uh, just a company issu issuing equities, and then you could. For example, in, instead of trading Bitcoin against a, a shitcoin, so the US dollar, you could uh, trade Bitcoin against uh, something that is less a shitcoin, for example, uh, an equity. And it would be maybe more interesting for traders to have access to this kind of markets. And you could represent um, the equities with, uh, with such, uh, such tokens. Um, but the thing is, I'm not entirely, for example, one of the um, the main usage of I, a lot of Bitcoiners see for tokens are stable coins. And right now with uh, things such as uh, stable sats, we kind of already have stable coins on, uh, on Lightning. And that's why I, I, I'm not completely sure that um, um, Taproot asset will really bring something uh, um, decisive enough uh, in this in this area because the the idea of Taproot asset is that you have a, a token somewhere on the network and you want to send it on the other side of the network and you just uh, you the, the token is uh, you send it to a liquidity provider which you share a, a channel with. And it's transformed into sats. The sats are going through the network and on the other edge of uh, the transfer, uh, it is converted back to, to the token. And so it's basically how stable sats works too because you're just uh, uh, sending sats. So that's why for, I think a lot of people view uh, Taproot assets as uh, especially useful to do uh, stable coins. But we already have stable sets, and uh, I'm not sure how it will play out. Uh, maybe, maybe Taproot assets uh, are better for that, but uh, I don't know. I mean, there is a clear product market fit right now for stable coins on other chains. It seems like the the volumes and the amounts of stable coins on these other chains is just like enormous orders of magnitude bigger than Bitcoin today. So I, I kind of wonder. Maybe you have some perspective on this because I know you do have a swap feature on LN Markets where you can swap your Bitcoin into a dollar denominated kind of futures contract where it pegs. Why aren't why aren't people using that in the same volume that they are on other chains? I I, I think it depends on where you're looking at. For example, uh, in the Blink wallet, so formerly known as the Bitcoin Beach wallet, they have the, this feature. Uh, so that's uh, it's where the name stable sats come from. They're the, the one calling it stable sats, uh, where you can uh, use, uh, as you described, future contracts to peg to to the value of dollars. And so I think, for example, in 
in El Salvador, maybe it's, uh, the, I don't know, but maybe it's the dominant way to, to have uh, a stable uh, balance in dollars. But I think on, on the other end, people just don't just want the cheap, easy option. And if what they can easily access is USDT on the Tron blockchain, they will use this because they they just want to, to have quick access to dollars and being able to spend them quickly and easily. And Lightning is uh, is yeah better and better in terms of usability, but it's maybe not quite there just yet, especially if you're used to uh, using blockchains and you don't have you don't want to learn something a bit new with uh, which uh, lightning is a bit different to to the way blockchains work so maybe it comes from that uh, and obviously um, so usdt has established itself as a very really big uh, big player and uh, i guess it will be hard to escape this kind of network effect one of the risks you outlined about stable coins bringing them onto bitcoin is that if that stable coin grows large enough it can now exert influence on the Bitcoin network. What is the threshold at which that becomes a real issue? Like where, how big does a stablecoin have to be? I guess it's a relative metric, right? It would have to be relative to the size of Bitcoin. Uh, Cause if Bitcoin goes up 10 X, then now you have to have a 10 X larger stablecoin for it to be an issue. Uh, but wh where's that threshold lie? How big is a, uh, can a, does stablecoin need to get before we go? Whoa, that's that's an issue. That's a good question. But what um, the, the thing is, you can have you you have a maximum of twenty million bitcoin, but you can have as much uh, as many stablecoins and tokens drilled on top of that using RGB or or taproot assets, and so it's it's quite easy to. I think uh, completely uh, overcome in terms of the market cap, uh, the market cap of Bitcoin on the Bitcoin blockchain but with uh, with some uh, some stablecoin token. So I guess uh, yeah, I don't know really how, where the the threshold is, but uh, um, the thing is, you 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 adding something completely external to the Bitcoin ecosystem. So I think what really plays a role in the fact that incentives are quite aligned on the Bitcoin protocol, is that everything is uh, is quite, uh, comes from inside the system itself, except for energy, which is uh, used in Bitcoin mining. And then if you add uh, tokens and things like that, it, it can uh, really, um, you know, um, change the incentives yeah and I, I i don't know indeed where this result is but i i guess it could come become a, an issue quite quickly if there are lots of people who have interest in uh, who have uh, who hold this uh, this stable coin they they want to be on the chain where the stable coin still holds value and uh, and so it can completely yeah uh, redirect uh, uh, a soft fork, but yeah, maybe it maybe it would would never become an issue. But we noticed it uh, it was the case on Ethereum, so I don't really see if uh, if Taproot assets and RGB are to be a, a success. I don't really see why it wouldn't be the case on Bitcoin. Yeah, I mean it's important to outline these things, right? To 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 bring up these things that you think could become issues, whether or not they actually do. Um, but I want to clarify your, your point about the market cap there was that it may not be important that this one stable coin grows larger than Bitcoin. But if you have thousands of coins all combined having a market cap larger than Bitcoin, which I think at, at times Bitcoin's market cap, I know this isn't a perfect metric, but it has been less than 50% of the overall crypto market cap, meaning there is more market cap, whatever value we want to ascribe to that, that uh, term, there has been more than 50% of that market cap in all the thousands of crypto tokens than there has been in Bitcoin at times. It's also been the reverse. 
So is it the idea that, that if everything did move over to Bitcoin, now all of a sudden there's this incentive for more value to uh, in all these other coins and tokens to then exert influence on the on the Bitcoin networks? That is that the idea? No, not really. I think it would still have to be uh, one or a few tokens or stable coins because w w the problem arises when there is one or a few entities. So, for example, I, I don't know Coinbase or Tether or something like that, who have uh, who can decide uh, which uh, uh, part of the fork that we consider as valid. And but you, I. Um, what I mean is, uh, you don't, you don't really. I don't think the you need to compare uh, the the stablecoin market cap with Bitcoin's market cap because uh, a lot of the bitcoins we that exist today, for example, are lost or they are not used by by anybody. There are satoshi's bitcoins, stuff like that. Whereas uh, for a stablecoin, usually it's uh, people are using them and they are counting on them to keep their value. Uh, and the um, whatever the side of the fork you end up into, you will still have uh, the same number of bitcoins as you did prior to the fork. But what changes is whether you still have the same, and you still have the same number of uh, of tokens. But what changes is whether they will have value or not. So any rational individual who holds both Bitcoin and this token would choose presumably to go on the to to uh, favor the, the the chain that uh, the for example stablecoin issuer described as being the valid one for them so th that's where they can play a role without even having to to uh, be something more than i don't know 10 percent of bitcoin's market cap of course for for it to have a substantial impact it would need to at least have some uh, yeah some scale but I don't think it needs to be really, really big to, to play your role. I hope you're enjoying the show so far. Just a quick message from our sponsor, Stackwork. Stackwork is a lightning powered platform for generating high quality transcripts of all your audio or video content. They combine AI engines and hundreds of human workers all over the world who are paid over the lightning network to assemble these transcripts. And that's what lets Stackwork create better, faster, and less expensive transcripts. To see the results for yourself, you can check out my personal website where I host transcripts for all my podcast episodes. If you want to learn more about Stackwork, visit stackwork.com. That is S-T-A-K work.com. Okay, let's transition to talk a little bit about custody and self-custody. You mentioned at the beginning, yes, LN Markets today is a custodial platform. Having Lightning means that users can limit the amount of time that you are in custody of, of their funds. Um, but you did allude to the possibility of a fully self-custodial experience. Can you talk about how that might work? One way of doing it, maybe uh, we'll discover more, but is to use what we call DLCs. So DLCs are discrete lock contracts. And so basically it's a way to uh, make a trade or a guess with someone. For example, you and I, we, we, we decide to bet on the price of Bitcoin tomorrow. And I say that it will be above, uh, I don't know, $30,000. And you say it will be less than that. And we can create a, a, a smart contract, which will automatically uh, settle tomorrow at a given time. Uh, and if you win, it will send the funds we deposited into the contract to you. And if I win, it will send the funds to me without any uh, further interaction uh, from us. So it's, it's uh, self-custodial in the sense that uh, you can uh, make a bet or, or engage in a trade and you, you don't have to trust your counterparty because uh, once... Uh, both of you have uh, committed to uh, the results of the trade. Uh, everything is uh, is um, yeah is quite set in stone, and uh, and there is really a way to to escape from the trade once it's been uh, it's been made. And it's it's similar to Lightning in the sense that it uses uh, 
and broadcast Bitcoin transactions as well. So basically what you're doing is you're just signing a, a bunch of transactions and your counterparty is doing the same. And when the, uh, the bet expires, uh, you can just publish the, the corresponding transaction and, and get the funds. And it, the, the missing piece here in what, in what I'm describing is it relies on an oracle who will publish uh, the result. And it, it's when the oracle publishes the result that you can then uh, publish the corresponding transaction and claim the funds. So that's, that's basically the way it works. And it, it works already on chain. Uh, you, can, you can use DLCs. Uh, but now the, the issue is uh, that it requires uh, on-chain transactions. And so the, the goal is to bring DLCs to Lightning. This way you can have uh, the same things, but off-chain. And so it's quite uh, difficult to achieve as well. Uh, for example, there are 1010 who are working on that. And we're kind of yeah, beginning to, to, to look at this as well. Are there any changes that need to be made to Bitcoin to bring DLCs to Lightning? Mm, no, I don't think so. Um, so maybe there are some changes, that, some changes that could make it easier, but it's kind of working uh, as of today. It's just that it's a bit difficult because you have to do, you, you, you're taking a Lightning channel and the thing is, if you, if you would just to use a Lightning Channel and make a DLC inside, then the problem you would have is that anytime something else happens on the channel, for example, you're routing a transaction, you, do, you would have to update the DLC and so and hence uh, uh, resign every uh, uh, transaction that represents the potential outcome of the DLC. And so it would be uh, extremely... Uh, 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 compute intensive and, and stuff like that. You, you would be uh, signing uh, transactions uh, all day long. And so you have to perform certain operations in the channel to uh, put uh, the funds of the DLC apart and put the uh, traditional lightning channel apart and don't mix them up together so that you can have a DLC uh, in a lightning channel. And that's the difficult, the difficult part, yeah. Uh, but no, it it it, it can work uh, as of today. It, it, right now, the, the process is uh, is in, I guess, making it work in practice, and coming with a specification as well, so that it can work quite the same between different implementations, and uh, different implementations can talk can talk to each other. Uh, but yeah, we don't need a soft fork. We don't need anything new. Does this disrupt? LN markets business at all? If there's now this like self custodial method for, for making these trades, like is there a risk that people go, Oh, well, we don't even need LN markets. Now we can just use this DLC. Yeah, maybe. And, uh, that'd be, uh, I, I'd say that'd be great uh, overall because, uh, if you can, yeah, uh, skip an intermediary, it's, it's all the better. Uh, the, the problem that isn't addressed per se by, by DLCs is how to find a, a counterparty for your trade. So for, say, for example, that you want to, to short Bitcoin, you'd have to find someone who's, who agrees to loan Bitcoin for the same amount so that you can uh, enter a trade with them. Uh, and so that's where uh, Ellen Markets or Tenten One can play a role it is in either being the counterparty or helping uh, both sides of the trade meet. Uh, but of course, now, now that we have a, a communication protocol such as Noster, for example, maybe it wouldn't, it won't even be necessary. I, I saw that uh, the the team from Mutiny, they in the latest latest blog post, they mentioned building a Noster DLC P2P marketplace. So maybe it it will be what will be used in the end. But yeah, it's it's not a. Uh, it's not an, uh, a trivial task to, to build such a marketplace. Uh, I guess that's one of the intents behind the uh, kit as well. It could be used this way, but uh, as we see, it's, it's really a hard problem. We have, you have a lot of, of things to ponder. Uh, you have a reputational problem, for example. Uh, how do you, uh, uh, how do you know if someone who makes an offer uh, for a trade is, uh, is legit or, or 
either it, it you wouldn't lose your funds, but you would lose time, and hence it's a uh, uh, you would have locked up funds uh, that could have been used other in another way, so you're losing money in the end. Um, so yeah, that, that's the big problem, and that's where uh, companies such as the markets can maybe still play a role in the future. Right. So that fundamental problem of bringing buyers and sellers together in a marketplace still exists, and that is still a role for LN markets to play. It's just that now you don't have to all have everyone trading on your custodial platform. Um, you may be able to do it elsewhere. Exactly. And there's the, sorry, there's the price discovery problem as well. So it's not just uh, finding uh, someone who wants to buy when you want to sell. It's really agreeing on what is the price of Bitcoin and, and stuff like that. So let's say you and I were entering into a trade. We have Let's imagine we have DLCs on Lightning and you and I decide we want to make a trade. I say Bitcoin is going to be above $100,000 next year and you say it's going to be below. If we are to make a trade, what trust do we have what, what what are we trusting in that process like imagine we're trusting an oracle and whoever wrote the dlc that it was written correctly right are there any other parties involved here not really it's you're just yeah you're trusting the software you're using that it's uh creating the good uh, the good the good transactions and and stuff like that you kind of trusting the the oracle but you're not so I'm, I believe it would require the, what, uh, what we call BLS signatures, but you could even build a, a blind oracle, which wouldn't even know what it signs, because the risk is that the oracle colludes with your counterparty. If it happens, the, the, the oracle could uh, say that the price was uh, 120K, whereas when it was not, and so you, you'd be uh, defrauded. But there, there are ways uh, to to build the records in a way that they don't even know what they're signing, which event they are they are signing, and so this way they can't even uh, partner with your counterparty to to screw you. So so it it really reduces uh, the trust by another margin. Let's go let's go into more LN market specific talk here. Uh, one one thing I want to bring up is you guys are continuing to grow really impressively, actually. Like, I think it was August that you guys put up that number on Twitter. I follow along with a lot of your stats and I believe it was over $50 million of volume. And that was like an all time high. I'd love to learn more about what is catalyzing that because you mentioned that, you know, one of the big drivers of activity on LM markets is volatile Bitcoin markets. And it's kind of, I mean, we've had a couple of ups and down days, but mostly it's been flat for the last few months. So, or, you know, flat to down kind of. So what what do you feel like is driving activity on LN markets today? When we're looking at volume, for example, on a daily basis, we, we still uh, see that um, price volatility plays a role, of course. But what we've been working on as well is making the platform more uh, reliable, so more yeah, less bugs and more easy to, easier to use. And with the, the, the goal is to attract uh, traders uh, which uh, have a, a huge volume. So for example, you, you have a, you know, 200, uh, 90% of users, but they only contribute 10% of the overall volume. And then the 10% that remain, they contribute 90% of the volume. So that's what we're kind of seeing. So there are just a, a few uh, whales, if you, if you will, on the markets, which contribute uh, most of the volume. And so we're trying to, to, yeah, to keep them on the markets and uh, and to yeah to make the platform uh, useful to them so that they, they stay and then the trade on the platform. Now I think I've got this correct. Correct me if I'm wrong, though. I, I see you, get, you do $50 million of trading volume. I'm pretty sure your your fees are between 0.1% and 0.06%. At the, at the, if, you're, if you're doing a high volume of trades, you get 0.06%. Low volume, you're 0.1%. So you're looking at somewhere in the range of like thirty to $50,000 of revenue per month. 
uh, if that calculation is right. And, and that's like a really impressive, you know, it's a real business. And it's cool to see that there's there's companies on Lightning that are that are achieving this milestone, getting to you know fifty thousand of revenue a month. That's like, you know, there's momentum there. That's a real, um, you know, it's a, a good stepping stone for building out like a sustainable long term business. Uh, are you able to comment on whether that's coming primarily from futures or options or, you know, what that kind of revenue mix looks like? Oh yeah, it's uh, clearly futures. It's like a I don't have the number, but I, I'd say it's more than 90% futures and then less than 10% on the options. Um, yeah, options are, are not, uh, yeah, clearly futures are the, the prominent feature on the platform. Uh, we will be looking at making options maybe more useful and more uh, complex. Uh, so with, uh, with option strategies in the future, but right now, yeah, it's mainly futures. Um, so yeah, yeah, Be, uh, we think it's because it's, the, the product is just easier. It's, uh, with, a yeah, you don't have to, to set a strike price. You don't have to set an, an, an expiry. You, you just uh, open the, the future in the, the direction that you, that you want. And, and that's it basically. So, and you do also have a swap feature, which I believe that's, that's currently free, correct? Yeah. So no revenue there today. No, we, we just, but it's under, uh, so the underlying uh, instruments, it's just the, the futures we're offering uh, uh, on the website. Yeah. And uh, uh, the volume in, in swaps is not really big either. So yeah, I, I guess maybe the, the users that find an interest in, in having a, a stable balance in, in USD, maybe use a stable sats or stuff like that. So now when you're thinking about how to go from this thirty to fifty thousand dollars a monthly revenue to like three hundred to five hundred thousand or three million to five million in revenue. Uh, what are some of the big drivers that you think will get you to the next level and get you to the point where you're like, wow, this is a really sustainable business. It's kind of growing on its own. It's kind of it's generating profit. Um, what gets you there? Is it the equities that you mentioned uh, potentially being an add-on feature? Is it doubling down on futures? Is it expanding the options, uh, you know, configurations that people can use? What do you think the big driver will be in the future? Um, I guess there will be many of them. Um, one obvious one is to just um, reach out to more users. And so right now, I guess we're, our typical user is a niche inside a niche because you have to already have Bitcoin, already have Bitcoin on Lightning and be willing to, to trade uh, futures and options. So I guess that's not that many people right now. So maybe one way to up those numbers would be to be able to, to reach users who don't have uh, Lightning yet, for example. So let's to find a way to, to, to reach them. Um, yeah, new features we're constantly looking at, for example, uh, the option strategies that I mentioned earlier. Um, we're looking at making the platform easier to use. Uh, and for example, one thing we could look at is how it could interact with Noster. So maybe we could, you could, uh, I don't know, but you could maybe uh, trade on the markets without leaving your Noster client. Uh, maybe that would bring some users from Noster who don't really know about the markets yet and who could use, uh, use the platform from the Nostor client. Um, but yeah, just uh, classical growth, I guess. Is there anything else on the roadmap for LN markets that you're excited about or you want to share more about? So yes, yeah, there is this thing about DLC that we are working on, which of course is, a, is really interesting because it's really on the design phase. We, we're just evaluating what we can do for, with that. Um, and apart from that, we are at the moment we're really trying to to make the platform more more usable and more reliable. And uh, so, no, n not really, not at the moment. Uh, but uh, yeah, yeah, DLCs, I guess. Now, I also want to bring attention to your Lightning newsletter. You've been writing this every week for over a year, and uh, you've got some really great content in there, chronicling kind of the news of the week in the Lightning ecosystem, and you know. 
because you have this perspective and you've, you've seen a lot of the cool apps being built, I'd love for you to share maybe some of your favorite apps or some of the most interesting ones or, or the ones that people just aren't paying enough attention to. You know, what are the things that you go like, come on, everyone, you should all be using this. This is the coolest thing ever. And just no one's talking about it. There are a few. Uh, for example, there is the Blix Toilet by, by Umpus, which is uh, which is quite great, I, th I think, because... Um, so, yeah, it's... We have wallets like Phoenix and, and Breeze, which are really easy to use, um, very plug and play. Uh, and so wallets that may appear a bit less easy to use might be uh, overlooked. And so I think that's the case for Blix, for example, and it, uh, it, it, came, it has come a, a long way. Now it comes with uh, an integrated LSP, so you can have a, a channel with inbound ca capacity quite easily. Um, and it's, it, there are some features that I find interesting. For example, there is the, uh, I don't recall the exact name, but something like Lightning Inbox, which, where the, the goal is to allow you to receive um, uh, funds on your Lightning address in, uh, it's not completely trustless, but it tries to minimize trust. And so basically the way it works is that the, 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 um, the service will, will hold the funds for you until you come back online and it will try to reach you to send you a push notification to, to wake the wallet up. But if you, if you can do that, uh, it will hold the funds for you while waiting for you to come back. Um, I think what Mutiny are doing is really impressive as well. With the, late, uh, the latest um, release, they introduced uh, Noster contacts. And I think contact lists are something really that was kind of missing because it's if you look at uh, the regular uh, fintech apps, uh, Venmo, Cash App, stuff like that, there is always a, a contact list where you can really easily find a friend uh, and send them uh, uh, 10 bucks uh, for, I don't know, splitting the bill, something like that. And it was really missing from, uh, from wallets. And uh, you could, uh, for example, send to a lightning address, but there was no way to just Hey, I already paid this person yesterday. It's still the same address. I just want to to pay that and don't have to not have to remember the address by heart. And so having a Noster contacts helps, for example, in this uh, in this case. Um, so yeah, of course, splicing uh, introducing Phoenix lately is really really I think important for for uh, self custodial wallets. And yeah, maybe the last, another development that I find interesting and Mutiny actually did that recently as well is how do you onboard people to Lightning in a self-custodial manner um, when opening a channel from an LSP typically uh, costs, uh, I don't know, 3000 sats. Because for example, if you if you want to, so you have a waiter at the restaurant and you want to tip them and you, you're not going to spend uh, $20 on your tip. And so you just want to send a few sats, but they don't have a wallet yet. How do you, how do you manage the situation? So often the answer has been to just uh, install a non-custodial, uh, no, a custodial wallet instead, like wallet of Satoshi, for example. Uh, because it's it, it just for, for for just a tip it might not make sense economically speaking to create a, a self custodial wallet with the the cost of opening a new channel and so what could be done is on on a self custodial wallet uh, maybe the the wallet provider could uh, hold the funds while uh, the balance is still low and for example, grant the user uh, eCash tokens in exchange as a as a, an IOU. And when the balance reaches a certain threshold, then it would uh, use this balance to open a, a real channel this time. And so having this kind of hybrid mode where you start custodial, but inside a self-custodial wallet, which would make the transition really uh, easier and maybe even uh, 
quite transparent for the user. Maybe the wallet could just say that there is a subscription for using the wallet self-custodially and you just have to pay this and it opens the channel. You don't even have to care about opening a channel. It just says, uh, here is a one-time purchase and, uh, and yes, just agree and uh, and things are set up on your end and, and you can use Lightning self-custodially. So now the question that remains is, would, you, would people see the value in, in using Lightning self-custodially? The, the problem is that as long as you're not rugged, you, you don't necessarily see the value in uh, holding your own keys. But uh, yeah. Do you think we'll see more self-custodial usage on Lightning? Do you like, if you think about the mix, I imagine right now, depending on the metrics you use or the, the numbers you uh, refer to, we're probably looking at like 90 plus percent uh, custodial usage on Lightning today. If you had to guess at, at maturity, once this ecosystem reaches everyone and is kind of like an established, once Lightning is more established, what does that mix look like in your view? I hope it will be higher, definitely more more self custodial usage. Um, there are some innovations that help achieve that. So LSPs are one of them. Uh, things such as green lights are another one because you can just have the complex part of Lightning Node in the cloud and just have the signer on your phone and you just don't have to bother with uh, with a lot of stuff. Um, so there are there's really work in progress to make it less and less difficult to run a, a Lightning Node, even inside a very constrained environment such as a phone. But still, the problem is it it's, it will always be costlier, I think, to to run a, to have a self custodial wallet than a, a custodial one until you lose everything because your friends want to. We're on a custodial wallet, so maybe if we get a big, uh, big rug pool, rug pool like we had with a drop bit. I don't know if you, yeah, you were probably around at the time, but there was a, a Lightning wallet called Drop Bit, which was a custodial wallet. I think it was in 2020, and uh, I, I don't remember the, the exact story, but I think the founder was uh, arrested by the FBI, something like that, and the funds just vanished. And but. As Lightning was still quite small at the time, it didn't have such a huge impact. But for example, if you if you imagine that Wallet of Satoshi uh, has a problem tomorrow, maybe it will have a, a big enough impact that people will finally start to, to understand why self-custodial Lightning is important. Yeah, that's definitely possible. Um, one final question is, are there any tools that you know, having looked around at the Lightning ecosystem and watched closely as the ecosystem has developed, are there any things, you know, outside of the scope of trading, any things that you think need to exist, but no one's working on it yet or or not enough people are working on it yet? Yeah, uh, I, I think, yeah, people are kind of working on it, but uh, it's just a, a time to market thing. But uh, Lightning has the the opportunity to completely replace every subscription based mechanism. Not maybe not everyone every every because f for the the companies that is offering the subscription, of course, it, it's it, it's interesting to have a to 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 know that you'll have a, a fixed revenue coming in every month. But now for the user, it might be more interesting to pay per use. And so I think what Lightning can bring is optionality in this regard. So for example, you can decide to uh, pay per use for uh, internet searches, for example, because uh, uh, there is a, uh, a search engine called Kagi, which uh, just uh, announced they, they accept Lightning payments. And right now they're running a subscription model because they are coming in from more the fiat payment method. But I think once it matures, they will see that they can have uh, per search payments. And uh, so basically microtransactions uh, where you just pay for every search and can be made completely uh, transparent for the user using uh, browser extensions. You just set a budget and you forget about it. And you say, I want to pay only $5 for web searches this month. And every time you make a web search, it will use this budget until it runs out. And there are really a lot of things that could um, 
could uh, be yeah completely changed with a with such a, a mechanism uh, netflix could uh, you could just pay per episode i don't know and, and you just you would just have to decide if it's more worth for you as a user to pay a subscription which gives you unlimited content or per per use and so for example in the the press as well uh, especially online newspaper you could pay per article for example and so of course it's being worked on because um, Lightning Labs, for example, recently published their L402, um, uh, let's call it a plugin, which or a proxy, which uh, helps you uh, transform your API into a paid API where people can just purchase stuff with Lightning on your API. Uh, and so it's, uh, yeah, it's being worked on, but I think we, uh, the, the rest of the world kind of still has to catch on what Lightning can and offer in that regard. All right, let's finish this off with some rapid fire questions. You ready? Yeah. If you could only hold one asset for the next decade and it could not be Bitcoin, what asset would it be? I guess it would probably be gold if I can't really have Bitcoin. Yeah. I want to hear a prediction for the end of this year. So December, 2023, how much volume will LN Markets do? You did 50 in August. And I think that that was an all-time high. I guess let's up maybe 70. 70 million. All right. I like it. Are there any builders in the Lightning ecosystem that you'd like to give a shout out to for doing great work? Uh, lots of. Uh, there is, so I, I guess there's a mutiny team, for example, really does a great job. Uh, Fiat Jaff. So is a bit more controversial in the Lightning ecosystem right now, but you definitely played an uh, instrumental role in, uh, in developing Lightning and LNURL and stuff like that. Um, yeah. Uh, I, I like what, what's being worked on uh, around the LSP spec. So there are there is a currently there is an uh, yeah, an ongoing work on coming with a common specification for LSPs, uh, which is led I think by uh, the synonym team by Aliage from uh, Bolt Observer. Uh, yeah, and maybe also the Async team. I think they're really doing a, a great job. They're way at the, the forefront, uh, both with their Lightning implementation as with their Lightning wallet. Thanks so much for taking the time to chat today. Uh, where can folks go to learn more about you, your newsletter, and LN Markets? So you can find the newsletter at blog.lnmarkets.com. And if you just remove the blog dot, you can uh, reach out in the markets. Uh, and you can find me on Twitter. It's at Fenis Mikalakis. Or on, uh, I'm on Noster as well. Uh, yeah, so it's npub, uh, Fenis, but with a, a G instead of the I, because you can't use I in Bash 32, but yeah. So I'm on Noster too. Well, thanks again for the time. Hope we can do it again soon. Yeah, thank you very much.